Guys, welcome to another episode. As you can see, we have Liam and Ben. Cheap Ben, as I like to call him. No. And today, Ben's actually spent a bit of money because he has done his shafts. Yep. And what happened to this? It got painted. Uh, yeah. So hopefully on this episode, you guys see us doing a little bit of work on the tray and getting it ready to be finished. And later on, you're going to see pictures of how I almost lost my hand. Yeah, that was not great. So on the last episode, you will have seen that we actually tried to make a tray. And Ben was meant to be the one to weld it to practice his MIG welding. Which Ben is now going to weld. Yeah. But little did I know that Ben actually organized this guy. This is Reese Mears and he is Ben's welder. Apparently there's one thing that Ben hates more than spending money. And that is actually doing work. So he's dragged this guy in here and is paying him to weld up the tray. And I have to say he smashed this out really, really quick and we were very impressed. Now, as most of you guys know, like the shirt right here, this whole car is meant to be blue. Now, the thing with that tray is we had to leave it outside because it doesn't live in here and it is winter. So just like most things, as you put them outside, they rust and that's what happened to the tray. So we had to paint it. Now, this actually had a fair bit of surface rust. So what we've done is we've blasted this thing with some rust converter. And then what we've done is we sanded it back and then we put as much edge primer as we could find some putty filler, and then we have slept on some 20 year old black paint. For anyone that wants to know, this is two in one, two pack jet black with 10% thinners on top. And it's spraying really nice for something so old. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we got Ben's brand new shafts that he got cut down in Perth. Yep. Now Ben, tell us what this is and what that is from and how you've made them mix together. Okay, so the shafts we had in the diff originally were not usable. They're just not the right sort of thickness in, in theory. So I was able to get shafts out of a later model uh, Triton, which is wider. That way the machinist was able to do this. He's been able to machine all the splines back into it, make them nice and long. He has shortened it, but long enough that we're able to make it fit into our diff. Yeah, and that's from a diesel. So, and that's yeah. what we think it was. Well, that was same. It was the same thickness in the very end, but they're just longer. Yeah, bottom. correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so from that was an ML, MLMN shaft into an MK shortened diff. Yeah, correct. And it's cost him around about a thousand bucks to get to this point. With the diff, the shafts, and everything, I need to about a thousand bucks. It's not too bad. It's pretty good. All inclusive. All right, let's uh, try to try do these bearings and slide in and see if this is actually going to work. Sure. All right, let's get to it. Now, because we are using the shafts made for the newer ML Trine, we don't know if the MK hubs are going to work. So we are pulling both models apart to see which hubs are going to work for us. After some playing around, we found that the ML shafts will only work with the ML hubs. The downside of this is we don't know the condition of the bearings in the ML hubs. So what this means is we have to chuck in some new ones so we don't run into problems down the track. And it was all going super smooth until this happened. All right, let's slide this in, Ben. Ugh. No point. Why is it no point, Ben? It doesn't fit, bro. All right, so we ran into a pretty big problem, but rather than actually explain it to you, let's just show you what the problem is. And this is the problem. Mitsubishi thought it was a good idea to put ABS on these shafts. So what that means is Ben's non-ABS diff is not deep enough to take the shaft. So what we have to do is get the ABS and chop it off. Okay. But the problem is when you chop this, that means that retaining ring now has to be moved. So we've chucked this on the lathe and we've cut it down. But the problem is we can't do that with the other shaft because it's already pressed in. So we're kind of at our standstill, but we're gonna make it work. We're gonna put the diff back in, we're gonna put the shaft together, and hopefully, hopefully it works. So the plan now is to remove, with great effort I may add, the ABS ring we have already pressed onto that shaft. As you can see, this was a heap of fun, but once it's all done, we send it off to Sean to modify the shaft so the lock pin is in the right spot. In the meantime, me and Ben get to press in the passenger side shaft and hub and install it into the diff. What? Why is it not going in? It should go in. What's happening? What is happening is clearly it's still not fitting and there's two reasons for this. One, the diff lip that centers everything 
too long. You gotta grind that down. The other one is actually by design. The shafts bed made them an extra bit long, so when we put them in, we can actually figure out the correct height and cut them down. So that's what Ben's doing with an angle grinder. And there we go, we're back from the machining shop. It's a new day and doesn't that look amazing? So he's machined the top of it nice and flat and he's cleaned this area up a little bit on this one. And he was able to do it with this still in the lathe so we didn't have to unpress it and wreck all of our hard work and those bearings on. So now the last thing to do is to do the spacer, put the lock clip in and then put it back in this car and then we can actually get this thing moving. So after removing the ABS gear, cracking a pose, pressing the spacer and slipping the lock ring on, I can finally complete this dip and get this rig rolling again. But now that this thing is on the ground, we've got the tray semi done, it's time to put the fuel cell in. Now a couple of things we're going to be doing different here. You see, this fuel cell had foam in it when we've taken all of that out because Ben is going methanol and methanol usually eats the foam. Another thing we're doing, instead of facing the outlets towards the front of the car, we're facing them at the back. The reason is this thing has no baffling, and as he's doing donuts, whatever, all that fuel is going to be slushing to the back. So this way, we're going to make sure that the fuel lines don't starve. Okay, so we're going back to high school. We're bringing out the old tri-square, the long ruler, and we're going to center this fuel cell on the tray. And while we're there, we also need to mark out a section that the feed lines can pop through the tray without any interference. Now, just like most things, I didn't get this right the first time around. So what we had to do, we had to cut another little section because, well, I don't want Ben to blow up. Fuel, metal on metal rubbing, not a great idea. So I want to make sure there's at least a little bit of clearance so we can get the fittings on and off, make sure they're tight, and obviously not rubbing against metal. But now that that is done, we can move on to the next thing, and that is installing these dual fuel pumps for the Trident. <laughs> After talking it out, we all agreed that having the fuel pumps mounted to the chassis and as close to the fuel cell would be the best idea. But unfortunately, this also puts them in the line of fire when Ben is popping tires. So we thought it would be a smart idea to install some shielding. And there you go guys, doesn't that look the business? Now as you see, there's the outlet of the fuel cell. Here's the fuel pumps. That's nice and solid, nice and close. We might end up putting some pre-filters in, I'm not sure yet, but we definitely will be putting one on the outlet. But let's show you guys what we actually did with the fuel line. Now you have to admit that that is a pretty impressive fuel feed. So that is feeding this engine, hopefully enough methanol so we can get about 800 horsepower at the wheels. So that's the goal. Uh, it's a single line all the way to the engine and then we're gonna split it off to each fuel rail so each bank has an even amount of fuel. We're then gonna go back to the fuel pressure regulator and come back via this return line into the fuel cell. But that's not it, as you can see, there's more here. So let's explain what the rest of it is. Now, before I talk about these lines, I'm just gonna go over these ones quickly. These are Ben's power steering lines. So we are going electric power steering. And the reason for that is your engine can blow up obviously doing a burnout or whatever and the last thing you want to do is lose steering when you're pretty much cramped with concrete all around you so we've done that so regardless of what happens to the engine he's got steering these are the oil feed and return lines for his automatic transmission and there's going to be a radiator at the back to keep that nice and cold well hopefully and the last two lines we've got are these ones right here and this is to cool the oil going to the engine so when Ben's singing this thing off 5,000 to 6,000 RPM, you know, the oil's gonna be at least cool. Talking about oil, we are slapping some oil into the diff. We are getting this Tron back on the ground and we are slapping the bare minimum stuff back onto it so we can get this thing ready to move under its own power. To you, Ben. Um, my power steering is disconnected, right? Y yeah, no power steering. I'm um, just trying to think like if anything's gonna go majorly wrong. Right, Liam's got the fire extinguisher. How are you oh, feeling? Can you have the fire extinguisher? Yeah, I'm sure you're right, mate. Oh, I'll, I'll have the fire extinguisher. Okay. Okay, so this is Ben's battery. Yep. Right, well, let's, let's have a look at your fuel tank. This is your fuel tank. Yep. As you can see. It's uh, safe. That's, that's safe, and we have to connect it up with these speaker wires, but that's all right. Yep. At the moment, we've got the turbos disconnected. Yep. Um, and we've got the math like but that. But the oil's so hooked up to everything. Oh, it was hooked up, yes, but yeah. there's no coolant in the engine. No. Um, either. So it is pretty jank, but we reckon it's actually going to 
well, run better. So let me hook up this and then Ben's going to try and start it and yeah. move it. Um, I just remembered I've got no brakes. You got no brakes? Yeah. Oh yeah, you got no brakes. You got a handbrake. I got a handbrake. Yeah, have you even checked if that works? It goes up. Is Winning. that good enough? No, that's, that's fine. Is that's, that like certified? Th that is certified. Let's okay. do it. Certified cool. YouTube mechanic. All right, cool. All right. You just tell me when I'm hitting the die button. All right, let, let's, uh, let's do this. And after some amazing electricity work, we are ready to start this thing up. All right, go. Oh, do you want to close the bonnet? Uh, no. Why? Don't you want it? If something goes wrong? You want a bonnet closed. All right, go. All right. Put on the brake. <laughs> now it was around this point where I started to realize that Ben wasn't having that much fun. He really was struggling to get this thing to actually drive. Now the whole plan was to reverse this back and see if we can get the wheels just to spin. But as you'll see in a second, Ben was just not having it. Just try. I, I, dude, I can't, I've got no brakes. Just do it. I got no, I'm gonna hit your car. Get Liam in there. <laughs> That is a mission. Wow. Fucked. That is terrifying. <laughs> that was all handbrake. So no, what was it? No, no power steering, no handbrake. The gearbox wouldn't engage unless I stabbed the throttle. No coolant. No coolant. And it started raining. <sighs> Can I go now? <laughs> what an adventure. All Aussie adventure. <laughs> See you on the next episode of Grease Garage. Thanks guys. Bye. <laughs>